All right, so uh, good morning. This is this is uh, Robo, and I'm here today with my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Rob Franklin. Dr. Rob is a, a veterinarian and a board-certified internal medicine specialist. That's those big, long string of letters that you'll see behind a, a person's name that gives them credentials uh, because of all the long hours they spent uh, through school. In fact, I think it's just thousands of hours of additional school after you get your veterinary degree to become board certified. Bob is, um, is on the board of the uh, American Association of Equine Practitioners, but he also has a, a lot of experience and um, understanding of, of, the, uh, of the physiology as well. And, and, and these are things that are taught in veterinary school. I just want to kind of give you some backstory on Rob and uh, good morning, Rob. Hey, Robo. Good to talk to you. Yeah, you bet. And um, so you're, you're, you're there in uh, Fredericksburg, Texas today. Uh, we are. We are. It's a beautiful day down in the Texas Hill Country. Awesome. Awesome. So I just wanted to visit with you today and uh, ask you some questions. Some of these are questions that, that we get from time to time that I thought would be interesting to cover. Rob is also the co-founder of uh, Full Bucket Animal Health. Uh, Rob and, and Dr. Keith Latson founded Full Bucket. And um, I'm sure Rob will go into some detail on how that all got started, but I thought we'd kick off today by just uh, getting into some of the uh, some of the problems and and things that people are going to find in their horses, some of the solutions you've come up with. So, um, start off with you know, uh, can you give me a little backstory on on your work history um, and what led you to uh, creating some of the solutions you have for the uh, the GI programs? Sure, sure, Robo. Uh, well, I did graduate from Texas A&M University from the vet school there, as well as Dr. Latson, and, and actually our our friendship started in undergraduate school, and, and we were roommates through vet school, and uh, after I finished in College Station, I moved to Southern California, practiced there for an internship, and then went to the University of Florida for three years to do that, that specialty training that you were talking about, the residency training, so that was four years after veterinary school that I spent honing my skills in a, in a very uh, specially oriented uh, discipline, uh, internal medicine, which deals with infectious disease, heart problems, um, any of the gastrointestinal problems that horses have, uh, neurologic problems, any of a host of complicated things that don't require surgery uh, and that don't involve reproduction. We are the the, the last stop for people to seek answers and treatment uh, with their horses. So uh, after we finished that, we moved down to Australia and practiced in a referral setting. And I ran an intensive care unit and was medical director at Goulburn Valley Equine Hospital for a couple of years. And then we moved back to Florida. And, and I set up another intensive care unit at uh, Equine Medical Center of Ocala. And so I was in, busy in the, the heart of thoroughbred country and uh, in Ocala, and also worked with uh, a lot of English sport horses and, and Pasifinos. Uh, after three years in Ocala, we moved home to Texas, and we're in Weatherford, uh, where I set up the third intensive care unit that, that I've set up in my career, and that was at Weatherford Equine Medical Center. Uh, again, in a, a slightly different discipline, being the, the hub of the cutting horse industry, but uh, had a wonderful experience working with the, the veterinarians there. We were there for five years, and, and subsequently I have uh, started my own consulting business. So um, it's, it's been a good, good run, and, and, uh, and throughout that process we've been, well, I've, I've really changed a lot of my own paradigm of, of managing disease and, and managing horses. Uh, I think as veterinarians we're, first taught about disease and about how disease happens and then how we can mitigate the effects of disease largely by using medicine and surgery to do that. I think that one thing that I've found to be very important is actually nutrition, both personally and also professionally and in, in the way that I care for my patients. I realized that uh, if, if we're not very conscientious about what these animals are actually putting into their system and making sure that it's optimized and that their systems are optimized, that uh, you know that the, the medicine and the surgery that we provide is really uh, a band-aid uh, and sometimes uh, can can create problems if you don't balance that that nutritional plan um, with the uh, with the medicine so 
nutrition is a, a big part of recovery and optimizing health in all animals. Uh, horses are no different, and certainly our our elite athletes are very, very sensitive to uh, n- nutritional and gastrointestinal disturbances. I think that when Dr. Latson and I first got together about coming up with some nutritional supplementations, we we were dealing with elite athletes and we were putting these athletes uh, through some, some surgical procedures to uh, remove chips and to, um, to fix fractures in, in the athletes. And when we did that, we were having to give them antibiotics just as a matter of course. We give them short duration antibiotics to try to um, prevent any infection from the surgery. And with the combination of the antibiotics and also the anesthesia where you, know, you basically got a 1,200-pound horse laying on their back for 30 minutes and then recovering for another 30 minutes, um, whenever you immobilize a horse, you are actually also immobilize their gut. And so their gut normally blends and churns and has a normal propulsive activity that assists in the fermentation. And whenever you put them under anesthesia, you stop all that. And so that fermentation, uh, if you think about Anytime you fermented anything, and I don't know, Robo, if you're still a home brewer or home winemaker, but uh, chances are we've all been uh, privy to, to the fermentation process, but it requires a constant stirring, right? And so if you, if you let that just sit, then that fermentation process gets thrown off. So my point being is that these horses were getting fed lots of good food, uh, so their systems were being strained to, to operate at the maximum level. Then they were getting antibiotics, which we know kills off not just the bad, but also the good. And then we were putting them under anesthesia. And so and we occasionally see some diarrhea. And sometimes that diarrhea can become life-threatening uh, in relation to all three of those factors. Um, and so, you know, that's the last thing that any of us want to happen when we have a horse that needs a... Uh, you know, a chip taken out of its knee. We want to go in there, take the chip out, put the horse in a recovery plan, and get the horse back into work as as soon as possible with as little pain and as quick a recovery. Uh, whenever you you get the horse in uh, with that sort of plan in mind, and then all of a sudden, three days later, you find uh, the horse fighting for its life because it's developed diarrhea. Um, that's bad. It's bad for the for the horse. It's bad for the owner. It's bad for the trainer. It's bad for the veterinarian. So, uh, Dr. Lass and I began looking at strategies. W- what do they do in people to prevent this? Because this happens in people too. And that um, had pushed us into the probiotic arena, which we we're both fairly familiar with and we're using to treat actual diarrhea, but not to, not to go in there and try to stop it from happening, especially in these elective cases. And so, uh, we found a, a certain strain of probiotic that was uh, had more science behind it than anything. A lot of nutrition supplements are have very weak science, and certainly they don't go through the uh, the research trials that we really need as scientists to say that something works or doesn't work. Uh, but this one actually did, and it it had all those criteria that made it uh, something very very useful. And so we started getting to human preparation and we started opening up all these capsules and it was it was pretty funny it was my nurses absolutely despised me when i would write that on the patient's uh, orders and and so we were opening up these little capsules and and dumping it into a syringe and then drenching the horses with it and um and we found it to be extremely effective extremely effective uh, as far as uh, minimizing the the, the antibiotic associated diarrhea and anesthesia related diarrhea and the change of feed and all those sort of things that that can create a GI disturbance and you know while we found that it worked um, you know just like anytime we find something that works in veterinary medicine we call our colleagues we talk about things we share at continuing education meetings uh, and 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 so that's what we did. And we were telling people about this. Um, I think it, it, as a profession in general, people were becoming more sensitive to the uh, benefit of probiotics, and, but, but still trying to wade through where is the science, where is the body of knowledge in terms of what works, how much do you need to give, um, 
you know, what are the indications? Are there any complications? You know, we're, we're all st waiting through that. And Keith and I really got uh, further down the line uh, in that than, than many people. And so we were sharing and, and then people wanted to know, you know, how they could get it. And we were sharing the human preparation. And then what we found is the owner compliance was terrible with that. So meaning uh, if I sent someone home with a bunch of capsules and said, open up 20 capsules a day and give it to your horse, then they were, they laughed at me. They laughed at me and, and most of the time the horse didn't. I always do. Yeah, exactly. So um, that pushed us into the arena of making it ourselves and, and going through the process of having uh, the right formulation developed for the horse. And, and so we came up with that. And we started using that in our own practices and then started sharing that with our friends. And before long, it, it had a, a grass fire effect and, and spread all over the country. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. And so I'm going to, I'm going to back up kind of back to the beginning of where you were talking about um, the fermentation in the gut, just for, just for people, uh, you know, all horse owners who've been around horses for a while have heard the term hind gut. Um, but could you kind of explain the, the you know the 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 differences in the actual physical physiology between a horse and say our gut or a cow's gut and 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 you know when you talk about fermentation well, how that's related to the horse specifically yeah that's a good question and you know as as veterinarians we spend years studying anatomy and physiology and and the differences between um, between the different animal species and and really it breaks down there's three basic types of uh intestinal tracts and there's variants in all of them but um the first would be the the ruminant and that would be the cud chewer that would be the deer the cattle um the animals that uh, whenever they they get the roughage they put it into a very large compartment uh there's actually four compartments in their in their stomach uh, a lot of people you know refer to them as having four stomachs but actually, what we refer to them as having four, F-O-R-E, is the, their, all their fermentation takes place in the front part of their digestive tract. So they take in the grass, it blends around in this big compartment called the rumen, they burp it up, they chew their cud, goes back in there. That chewing the cud is just a process to break down the, the grass and the hay and, and uh, to get the... Um, the the, firm, the 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 fiber broken down into small pieces so that microbes or little bacteria and fungi uh, and protozoa can get into that and and break it down and they can get nutrients out of it and so that um, that process goes in and it goes on downstream then they have some enzymatic uh, process as well where where they take they have enzymes that the animal makes that break down the food. Um, more and more, and then they're able to absorb it, and then it passes on further down. Now, another type of uh, fermentation is the hindgut fermenters, and this is uh, mostly deer, uh, sorry, horses, and uh, rabbits would be uh, a hindgut fermenter. So the animals still rely on fermentation to digest their food, but they don't chew their cut. Because all this happens way downstream, so at the very back part of the intestinal tract. So cattle are foregut fermentators, horses are hindgut fermentators. So that's... That explains quite a bit that I, you know, I've heard those terms a lot, but that's, I think that's the first time that I've understood that part. Right, right. And, 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 and if you just look at them chewing their cut, and you can tell what they're doing. Um, but, but horses... Uh, so when their food first goes in, they actually go through that enzymatic process first uh, to to get them to to digest a lot of their food through the enzymes. Uh, that that happens in the stomach. That happens with the pancreas and the and the juices that come out of the liver, and then the small intestine, and then the, all the hay and everything that's not digested enzymatically. So this is going to be corn, oats, any of the grains that we put in there then those things um, actually get um, go through the fermentation process when they, sh they should have been broken down by the enzymes. And, and sometimes you don't want things back in the, in the fermentation process 
because they ferment too rapidly. They ferment uh, in, a, in a very negative way. Um, the, the, the horse's intestine and their cecum, which is the same as our appendix, but it's about three or four gallons big where our appendix is like that big. Mm -hmm. uh, th these things hold massive amounts of fluid and, and the fermentation is, um, is, it, it, it's a very delicate balance because they can't, they can't eructate or burp like a cattle and they can't um, just add more saliva to it. It, it, it it's basically a sealed uh, part of their intestinal tract in the back that the only way uh, anything can gas and stuff can get out is by them um, passing gas uh, or, or having flatulence, which we all know when we've had horses, horses gas colic off, and that's because all that gas is being produced, which a cow normally just burps up very easily, well, all that gas has to get out through the back end in a horse. And if there's any obstruction or problem with that gas getting out, then they very quickly bloat, and, uh, and they, can, they can have you know, severe abdominal pain or colic. Now... The third type of intestinal tract, now that we're all thoroughly confused, we've got the fore and the hindgut, um, but is a monogastric tract. And that's going to be similar to what a dog has or what a pig has or what a human has, right? So those animals primarily work by enzymatic digestion in the stomach and the pancreas and the liver and using the small intestine. And we have a little bit of capacity to ferment our food, but not a lot. Our colons, where fermentation takes place, are uh, proportionally, uh, you know, a tenth or less of the size of a horse's. Um, so, you know, we we have a hard time. If we're just going to eat, go eat grass. We wouldn't get by very well. If you're just going to go have straight salad every day, you wouldn't get by very well. Um, there is uh, nutrition in that stuff, but really, you have to be able to ferment a lot of it to be able to get the the maximum nutrition out. We just don't have the capacity. We need to enzymatically digest a lot of our food. Now, that leads into a big problem whenever we're trying to get cattle or horses to uh, produce more. So if, if you're, you're in the cattle industry, you're either in the meat or the, the dairy industry, and you're trying to get as much milk or meat out of those animals as possible, uh, and so you're putting food in there and trying to get that fermentation process to run as efficiently as possible and also trying to utilize their enzymatic processes as efficiently as possible. Now let's talk about the horse. We're, when we have an elite athlete that we're training and exercising every day, um, the horse is just at the top of this game. Uh, if you think, you know, Rubble, when you and I exercise, we have to really change our diet. We have to be able to provide those amino acids. We have to provide the energy substrates for us to perform. And we have to provide the vitamins for our body to utilize to recover as well. All that has to be optimized for you to get optimal results as an athlete. So what we, the first thing that we typically look at is energy and making sure that animals get enough energy. A horse can only ferment so much food. You can't just give them more alfalfa hay, right? I mean, we know that, that that's not going to work, that um, more grass. You can maximize that effort. I'm sorry? You can maximize the input effort. You can reach a threshold that they can't, uh, they can't do any more with the hay, or you'll have deleterious effects with the hay. So if you took, like, grass hay and you just said, uh, I'm going to feed the horse as much grass hay as they can eat, they can't, eat in, and I'm going to put them in the race training, or I'm going to make him a, a competitive barrel athlete or an endurance horse. Uh, you can't get enough into the system to have the energy that the animal needs to operate. Okay, uh, let's take another substrate such as alfalfa. Well, if I just gave my horse free choice alfalfa, we all know that the alfalfa is too rich, and they're going to colic. So if he just had 24 hours a day, the horse ate alfalfa, the horse is going to colic and probably get diarrhea. Same thing with grain. I need to go, so if I, if I have an acceptable amount of hay, but I've reached the threshold on the hay because anymore they may colic or there's not enough nutrients in the hay for them to get any more, then I've got to go with a grain. And the grain also has a threshold because when you utilize the grain, you're maximizing the enzymatic part 
of the fermentation process. The enzymes have to go in there and break that grain down, and you have to break most of it down because otherwise if you get a lot of, of corn and stuff headed back to the, to the fermentation vat, it will create chaos on the fermentation vat. You will get the pH of that, the acid level will go way up, and the pH will go way down, and you'll kill all the good microbes in the back part of the intestinal tract. That's why if horses break into the feed barn and they get into the deer corn or they eat a whole bag of oats uh, or something like that, that's why they get sick is because all that grain cannot be enzymatically digested. It gets back there, gets fermented, and it creates total chaos. And we, I mean, horses founder diarrhea and they die from that whole process. Have you seen that before? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, it is frustrating. As a veterinarian, I mean, I, I hate that when, you know, people bring in that sick horse and it's all bloated and, and they say, yeah, hey, it got into the grain room, you know, or got in the feed room and got into a bag of grain. But um, so it, sounds so, like, it sounds like just a side yeah. note, so it sounds like a little bit like there's, there needs to be a real balance in, in all of that. You're exactly right. You're exactly right. And that is, uh, that's the answer with these athletes is finding that balance. And what we normally see is uh, that producers or trainers take the, the animals and they put as much into them as they can until they get on that tipping point if they start to see problems with them, with diarrhea or with colic. And whenever they see too much of that, well, then they back off a little bit. That's one way to do it. That's not the optimal way to do it. Uh, but that's that's one way. I mean, like anything, I mean, you try to hit it as hard as you can, and then where you, then you see a problem, then you back off a little bit. But we prefer to take a little more proactive approach, realize what the problems are, and try to mitigate those before they even have a chance of happening. So what, what you want to do is create that balance by feeding them the good roughage that they need. They need the fiber. That's where they're going to ferment. And then you want to give them the good grain part that has all the energy that makes up for the lack of energy in the fiber product, but let them digest that in the best way possible in the front part of their intestinal tract with the enzymes. And so you don't get a big load that goes of corn and, and grain that goes to the back part of the intestinal tract that creates, you know, a, a havoc on the, on the fermentation process. So um, that's the, that's the general anatomy physiology of the three types of digestive tracts and then what the limitations are now it, out in the wild robo it, it's you know like bison uh or cattle uh or horses they're gonna do fine on just eating grass and and really their their tracks are set up for that because their demands aren't high they they're not trying to make ribeyes and you know in gallons of milk they're trying to just sustain themselves and horses aren't running, you know, a mile and a half, um, like American Pharaoh, you know, they're, they're just need to out, outrun the slowest one in the herd and, uh, you know, to keep the wolves off their heels. That's about all they need to do. So it's only through us needing to, um, you know, optimize these horses to be the, the, the top athletes that we need to even consider feeding them, uh, you know, any of the grain substances, um, or other energy substances, the fats and oils that that provide them with the necessary nutrition to to perform at the levels that we're asking them to do, which is is great. I mean, their performance. Let's face it, um, it, it is uh, it, emo at an emotional level. You know, their their performance is, is is so cool. The way that people have interacted with horses. So whether or not that was years ago, working. Um, with the horses or now competing with them in, in, in pleasure. I mean, we have had to feed our horses extra ever since we've domesticated them because they're not wild. So it's not, it's not unnatural in the, in the history of mankind to have to supplement the horses. It's just unnatural from the way the horse was initially designed whenever man wasn't involved. So let me ask, so, you know, I'm, let's say I'm a, let's say I have some performance horses and I'm, I've got them in various stages of, of training and, and um, under different stresses. Uh, what are some common, you know, if I'm trying to dial it in and figure out what I'm looking for, you know, as far as like signs that may, I may be feeding too much of one thing or another, or maybe not enough, what are some, what are some common signs I'd be looking for to help dial that in for me um, quicker? 
Yeah, and and some of them are very very subtle, and some of them are very very obvious. I mean, the most obvious one is going to be a horse that has so much um, fecal water that it's it develops pipe stream diarrhea, or it's painting the walls with diarrhea, uh, or it's on its back colicking. Uh, and those those are the the most uh, you know obvious signs. Now, probably if you if you look in you know in athletic barns, um, probably one of the more common signs you would see would be that they're instead of having nice green road apples that their manure is um is soft and maybe looks like that of a cow um that that to me as a veterinarian is uh you know is a red flag that their that horse's gi tract is not working optimally uh and and we're going to be seeing some some more severe problems uh, we may be seeing a, a lack of performance that we can't put our finger on um but whenever I see that, that that horse has that cow flop type of manure, I know that there is a, an issue with that that cow or with that cow flop manure that that tells me that the GI tract is not working. So, what uh, other subtle things that, that horsemen come up with are a bad hair coat. They come up with. Um, Kind of a, the horse begins to go punky whenever they put the uh, grain in. It only finishes, uh, you know, half the grain meal. Has a few bites, walks away, uh, or just uh, it begins to get a little sour during training. Normally, those signs are that uh, we've got a fermentation problem with the the hindgut, and that the the horse is getting too much acid built up in there. That may create some inflammation in there. May even create some ulcers in the back part of the intestinal tract. Or they could be having um, ulcers develop in the in the front part of their uh, intestinal tract in their stomach as well, and so those are those are very common uh, symptoms of a GI disturbance. But they can be they can be subtle. They can be subtle. I just spoke with a uh, a really good horseman yesterday, and and who was describing some of those things. You know, he's got some cutting horses that that have you know. It's, it's summertime here in Texas. We're June. We've had a mammoth rains over the past, you know, six weeks. There's grass everywhere. I mean, every horse should be dappled up and just looking peak, right? And, and when you've got healthy healthy animals that uh, are being fed, you know, the best feed in the world, uh, and they're not dappled up and their hair coats look rough and they're on good worming programs and, and, and everything, it, it's a very clear sign to me that, we've got a GI disturbance that is um, that this causing that. And that, you know, particular horse I'm talking about has already been scoped for ulcers. It doesn't have ulcers. Um, it doesn't have sand, you know, it doesn't have some of the other medical problems. It, it simply has an unoptimized GI tract. Now, um, you know, you mentioned ulcers. <clears throat> is th these effects that are this balance that we're talking about, is that a, is that a big, um, uh, cause uh, for ulcers as well ulcers can whether you're a person or your horse ulcers can develop for a number of reasons and and you know we one of the big things is uh, a balance in nutrition or a balance in for you and i it may be life balance but it in horses it, it's a balance in in uh, in stress and well-being as well um, so you and I think about stress with, with work and with, uh, getting to family events and making sure that we're present with our children and stuff, but, but horses are herd animals and the way that we manage them is not natural at all. So whenever you've got an athlete that's spending time in a barn, uh, in a stall away from others, um, not able to, um, you know, kick his heels up and run around and, uh, in a pasture, um, that is that creates physiologic stress and stress is not just a mental uh problem it actually creates a cascade of horm hormone releases that actually have a physiologic effect that is um, supposed to be in short doses supposed to be enough for us to you know uh grit our teeth and to get through something that's difficult but in chronic doses that those hormones are actually detrimental, right? They're detrimental to our, all parts of our bodies, whether that's your joints or your, or your stomach. Uh, it's stress is, is is hard on us. It's hard on horses too. And and one of the places that they do show that is in their their stomach and and their um, and even their their hindgut. They can show um, intestinal stress. So 
uh, that's part of it is balance. Um, the other part is uh, the balance with the nutrition and us trying to put too much rocket fuel into the horses uh, and their systems aren't optimized to be able to cope with that. And so um, we can do some things to try to get their systems to be able to cope with that because they do. I mean, at the end of the day, they need that energy. They need those vitamins. They need those minerals. They need that fiber. They need all that stuff that we're trying to put in front of them. They can't get it out. I mean, it's, you know, a, a rocket needs rocket fuel. But if you've got, if you've got a problem with the system where they, you can't get all that, you're running the system too rich then you're going to have a lot of unburnt rocket fuel come out the back end. And when you reach, you get a lot of unburnt rocket fuel or grain and, and energy in a horse, it goes into the back part of that intestinal tract. And that's, again, where they get that, that disturbance with the whole um, fermentation process. And they call it, get diarrhea, they get a sour gut, they get hind gut ulcers, and, uh, and you get poor performance. You get a horse that just doesn't feel good. So to clarify, what you're you're really saying is that um, if I'm if I have these horses under extreme you know uh, training programs or maybe even not that extreme and and I'm trying to keep weight on them and give them give them energy, I can be pouring really good food in the front end, and if the uh, if the system's not set up correctly, the, I'm I'm basically just uh, you know making the problem worse. You're, you're number one. You're, you're wasting a lot of money, and number two, yeah, yeah you're you're adding. Um, you know, it's not the, they've already have enough. They're just not able to get it out. They're not able to get that nutrition out. Um, you know, I always I always laugh because I never really understood Einstein's e equal e equals m c squared. I think you and I talked about this one time, but you know, the the thing is that that the energy that is in any given um, mass of, of, of food is so dense. There's so much energy in there. And Einstein's theory was that it, it's, you know, MC square C is the, is, is the speed of light. And then you square that. That's a big number getting squared, right? And, and M is mass or the amount of, of substance. Well, if you think about energy, E equals the mass times the speed of light squared, that's huge. Well, we're talking about, say, a uh, grain. Well, there is so much energy in grain that we have, the body has to try to get that energy out. Well, a lot of that doesn't come out. Most of it, 99.99% doesn't come out. According to Einstein's theory, I mean, there's a lot in there. Uh, we could all sustain ourselves for a long time on one corn kernel if we were able to optimally get all the energy out. We see a lot of stuff go into the stall floor, right? Undigested food, especially in these athletes where they're being pushed so hard. So what I'm saying is that as a, as a trainer, in, or you like to team rope, you know, on your rope horses, if you're, if you're taking that horse and, and it's not gaining weight, you just try to put more food in there, you, you, you know, assuming that you're providing a basic diet of, of good nutrition to begin with, that's not the answer. The answer is to try to get what you're putting in that horse twice a day already and the grass and the hay that's eating throughout the day is getting all the energy out of that that you can. And so don't go buy more feed and don't go try to give them an extra scoop of grain. Try to get all the energy out from the stuff you're already giving them to begin with. That's a that's a really interesting perspective. And one I think that, that, that a lot of people aren't really getting getting at all. Yeah. So, um, so I know I know that you are not a fan. You know, we're talking about nutritional supplementation. I know that you are not a fan of uh, just supplementing for supplement's sake. And um, I know, also know that you're not a fan of 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 putting minute amounts of everything in to supplement. So, can you kind of summarize what? you know, what, what, what a good philosophy is for supplementation as far as concentrations and ingredients. Yeah. And, and that's a, you know, I think as veterinarians, we're a little bit sensitive to that because quite honestly, people get marketed to in a way that makes them feel compelled to get some of everything into their horse, you know, um, I, 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 I think it, as a side deal, I, I, I've been guilty myself just with my own personal supplementation. Uh, prior to our discussions um, over the past few years, 
I would go pick up a can of, of, of some sort of supplement for my workouts and I'd try to get the one with the most ingredients on it. Right. I just want to load it up. Right. I got everything. It must be good if there's a thousand things in it. Right. Exactly. And that's, um, yeah, and that's tough because we're marketed that way for our horses and for ourselves. And, you know, it's like, where is the truth? And even when you look at something like probiotics, you know, where where is the truth with probiotics? And, and let's face it, we don't know everything about uh, anything. But, but what we do know is that there are, um, if you just put a little bit of everything into your system, you're not going to have any effect. Uh, it's like trying to... Uh, to go to work and work a thousand different jobs and expect to get a paycheck. You're not going to get a paycheck. You're not, your, your body's not going to get a paycheck from the nutrition if you just did a little bit of everything. But we do know that there are some core things that it, you can put in your, into the system. We'll call it a system because the, the digestive tract is a, is a very complex system. We know that we can optimize that by putting some select things in there. But just like if you were going to work and you wanted to focus on getting a result, you would make sure that you put enough effort into that system to get a measurable result. That is where I think that quantity and quality begin to be big players in these supplements. Uh, it's not just the, the diversity of the amount of ingredients that are in there. You can have 75 ingredients in there and not have a measurable amount of any of them. And so, you know, you're essentially wasting your money. And a lot of our multivitamins are that way for ourselves as well. And there's a, a lot that go into horses that are designed exactly. In the industry, we call that label dressing. It's there on the label. People don't know if their horse needs one milligram or a thousand milligrams or a thousand grams of a specific item, right? They see the item. It must be good. It, there's there are 75 other items in there. It's got to be good, you know, and and, it, and it's hard to know enough about all that stuff to make an informed decision. Um, then we start talking about quality. A lot of these nutritional ingredients don't even get absorbed. The way they're combined with other ingredients, they don't get absorbed. The way that uh, they're formulated there are certain vitamin E's that are formulated uh, to be preservatives. They're to make sure that the product doesn't go, doesn't get rancid while it's sitting on the shelf. Uh, it has absolutely zero nutritional benefit. Your body can't absorb it, yet it's listed as a source of vitamin E. Uh, and so if, if someone goes in looking for vitamin E, then they pick that up. That horse is going to absorb zero of that particular type of vitamin E. Um, so all those those ingredients have quality uh, disclaimers and they have quantity disclaimers. And it's, it's hard for us to be able to say, you know, uh, on every level what the animal needs. But in some cases, we do know through uh, National Research Council on how much uh, animals need. We know how much athletes need. We know that some things need over-supplementation. Um, certain B vitamins uh, need over supplementation in athletes. We also know that whenever it comes time to talk about something like probiotics, that they really have a, it's a numbers game. You're playing uh, in a body system that is operating on the order of trillions of microbes, trillions of microbes, right? So that's, uh, you know, a thousand billions is a trillion. And we're talking about hundreds of trillions of microbes. That's a, that's a big number. So if we're going to have any sort of impact in there, uh, you, you've got to actually put effective numbers in there. They've got to also survive the um, being in the bottle or in the tub. They've got to survive the heat and the moisture in the, in the environment. They've got to sur survive the digestive tract, the enzymes that are in the front part of the intestinal tract and the stomach in the small intestine, and they've got to make it all the way back to the back, uh, into the hindgut, where all that fermentation takes place. So that's, that's probiotics. I mean, that in itself uh, is, a, is hard for consumers to know because they, they see it's a probiotic, and then they see uh, this one's got five strains, this one's got 50 strains, this one's got one strain. They don't know the right strain. And then some of the strains, the genus is the same, so the first part of the name. Uh, would be the same in the second part of the name, what we call the species name. Th those are different. Well, those can be as different as if you're a horseman, you know about uh, strangles. Well, strangles is caused by a bacteria called Streptococcus equi, subspecies equi. 
that is a very contagious, um, virulent disease. It has a cousin named Streptococcus equis, subspecies Zoo epidemicus, that uh, I can paint all over your horse's nose, and uh, it wouldn't get sick for a minute. Mm. And, and so the 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 it's so confusing to the horse owner to know what to go look for. It, it's even confusing for the veterinarian. I mean, we study a lot of microbiology to be able to understand diseases and virus and and uh, and bacteria and to be able to be able to understand those nuances that I just explained. Well, we also have to know the nuances of the good bacteria and the good fungi that are out there that can be able to, to uh, help these animals. And, and that's, um, that, that's why we go to continuing education. That's why we read journals and, um, and stay in research throughout our entire career so that we can understand that. And it's hard to expect a, um, a horse owner to, to understand that whenever, um, you know, we as professionals have to stay on top of our game just to be able to get our heads around that. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and you know, kind of as a, a follow-up to that, do you happen to know of, uh, I know, I, I think I know part of your answer, but do you happen to know of some some areas where um, interested horse owners could, could maybe um, learn more or where, where should they pay attention and, and get their education from? Well, you know, I'm always going to advocate for the veterinarian being the, the, the number one source of nutritional information. I, I nailed that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Kind of like a, asking a, a dentist what, uh, <laughs> where to get information on a toothbrush or toothpaste, yeah. right? Um, you know, I mean, we, we feel like out of everyone, um, we're going to have more working knowledge in those areas than, um, than any other source. Uh, you know, I mean, honestly, the farriers probably doesn't have any nutritional background. Um, there are ag extension, you know, people in, especially in, in Texas, in the Midwest, there, there are people that are there to provide uh, nutritional guidance uh, as far as pastoral management and, and things like that. So I think that they're another trusted resource, as are the, the agricultural universities. But in terms of having direct access and things that you could you know, people you can act, interact with on a daily basis. I mean, really, who else is there other than the veterinarian that has any training uh, on these things? I, I will admit, and I think people are very quick to criticize and say, you know, physicians and veterinarians, um, you know, they only get so many classes of nutrition. And, and, and that's, that, you know, that, that is true, that, that we get, I mean, we've already talked about the number of different species that we study as veterinarians and to understand those different digestive tracts and how they, and how the nutrition interacts with those different digestive tracts. Um, but we still, our, our working knowledge is there. Whether or not we have a particular interest and we, we dive more into that and we, um, we go to that uh, uh, with a, with a detailed interest in reading journals and, and going to continuing education. Some people do, some people don't. I mean, it's, it's like asking your, your orthopedic surgeon to know all about, um, you know, what supplement should my, my grandfather who's got Alzheimer's take? I mean, he's, that's, that's beyond the scope. I mean, he can tell you exactly everything there is to know about a, a joint and, and probably what, what uh, effects nutrition has on the joint, but, but we can't know everything about everything. And so I would just put that as a disclaimer, but I think as far as a general trusted source, there's no one better. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. So, um, the, uh, I know that, you know, your involvement with full bucket and your and Keith's reason for getting it going, um, is, is a really great story. And, um, it goes beyond just you guys putting product into a tube, uh, so that your colleagues could have access to it. Um, why don't you kind of give us a little bit of, um, um, information about your philanthropy and and sort of the fuel that that drives your bus well that's um that is a fun part to talk about for sure um keith and i are obviously very passionate about uh our profession as veterinarians it's we feel like uh we really had uh you know a, a great opportunity to be veterinarians a lot of people uh, have a lot of respect for the industry. It's uh, it's very uh, charitable in itself, and, and it's very rewarding just to be able to, to help people with their animals and to to uh, see the enjoyment that people get with their animals. I think that we is as we got into full bucket and as we started uh, to 
become entrepreneurs, I think that was the time that we started to try to rationalize that. We didn't have to rationalize our veterinary practice very much. You know, you bring me your horse and I make it better. And that there's a lot of value that's instilled in just that, that process. I think that we feel um, somewhat the same if I, if, if, um, if you buy one of our products and we feel like we've got good value and hopefully your horse is going to feel better after being on our product. But we also felt like we've got a business and we need to be good stewards of that business and the resources and the money that that business brings in. And, uh, and so we, we started looking for ways to, to use the business as a platform to help other people and to also help fellow veterinarians help other people. And that's where we started um, looking into volunteer work as veterinarians and um, we started going uh, internationally into third world countries and and working on uh, working animals there's over 100 million working animals in the world that provide transportation and also um, cargo for um, their cargo animals in lots of parts where people don't have access to a pickup truck um, you know they're working in mountainous regions that you know, hauling coffee and firewood out of these these places that uh, those loads would be on a backpack, a very crude backpack, or be on their head and be on their kids' heads, and their kids wouldn't be in school. And so they, these donkeys and, and horses that operate as working animals, they they are um, the lifeblood to these families, and um, they're very valuable. Uh, they're very expensive for families that make uh, on average a dollar to two dollars a day. Uh, you know, these animals can cost 300 to a thousand dollars. Um, you know, that's dang near a year, half a year's work, uh, to get one of these animals. They have no idea how to take care of them. Uh, they don't know how to prolong them. It'd be like giving them a, a tractor and not showing them how to change the oil or how to lubricate the fittings and the, the bearings. You know, what's going to happen that exactly what happens when people donate tractors in those areas you you and i've been down there we've seen those tractors on the side of the road there's no education right they don't they get a tractor and they they use it until it breaks and then it's broken and then they either wait for a new one or uh or go go back to doing things without a tractor and and so um keith and i found that there is a need for uh, service so going down and taking care of these animals, they're heavily parasitized robo. Uh, they, they need dental care. They need wound care. Their, their saddle sores just, you know, make you just pass out, you know, with some of the saddle sores that you see. Their orthopedic disease, uh, broken down legs and tendons and ligaments and, and things are, are just terrible. But so there, there's an immediate care that, that we provide by doing these volunteer trips. There's also a, a longer term care, and that is where we work with the owners and probably even more importantly with the local veterinarians uh, to provide continuing education on how they can care for these animals and also instruct their own their own countrymen on how to keep these animals um, going for longer periods of time. And, and you know, from a welfare aspect, we're hoping that these animals can work, uh, but they can work pain free you know, for, for years to come. It is not a short cycle that, that they don't have to unnecessarily uh, get orthopedic disease or saddle sores or, or eye trauma because the people are, are not um, educated on how to care for them. Um, we also found that uh, the nutrition there is, you know, again, we're talking about working animals. So we've, we've already discussed that, that they need more than just forage to get by, right? Um, you can't get enough energy if you were, if I were to put you and work in the hills of Guatemala and say, carry down the coffee beans and I, and I was just going to feed you a piece of bread and some water, you know, you're going to quickly get down to a very low body condition. Um, and, and you're not going to have any of the micronutrients, the minerals and vitamins, uh, amino acids that your body needs to recover, uh, from the hard day's work and also, um, to, to grow because these animals get worked very young, right? And they're still growing and, and with bad nutrition, they, they get terrible orthopedic disease. Uh, so, so we began to look and say, okay, well, we can help these people as veterinarians. We can also help them because we're a nutritional company. And so that was sort of, um, we used full bucket as a platform to, to go down and, and operate uh, on a volunteer basis as veterinarians. We also use it as a way to get better nutrition. So we do a, 
for every serving uh, full bucket that we uh, provide in the U.S., we provide a serving of a specially manufactured full bucket. It's made internationally in the country of origin uh, that's developed for those working animals specifically uh, to address some of their shortcomings in their, their nutrition. Uh, so we provide those to those working animals on a one-for-one -one basis. Um, it, it's great. It, I mean, you can, you can quickly see the benefits of, of the animals um, in terms of some of the more basic things like hoof growth and, and hair coat. Um, but you can also see their body condition scores begin to improve over time as well. Uh, I think that there's also something that goes along with um, whenever you provide an owner with something that is um, going to enhance the well-being of their animal. They all of a sudden begin to take pride in their animal a little bit more. Maybe things don't look quite as hopeless as they looked before. Uh, we try to provide them a little education. We deworm them. We get them some better nutrition. And then all of a sudden, you know, people, it's kind of like if you had a junk car and I took your junk car and I put it in the car wash, I gave it an oil change and I gave you some special fuel additive. You know, you're kind of going to bow up a little bit and take a little pride in your junk car and you're going to uh, maybe, you know, repair the tires and keep things lubricated and, and do some stuff where, where you care a little bit more about it. And, you know, I think sometimes they just feel so hopeless. But the last thing I would say is that, and some of the coolest part of it is being able to interact with the local veterinarians. You know, Robo, they go to school uh, and they're so passionate about animals in these countries, but their, their opportunity to be educated at the level that we are is certainly not there. Uh, their experience is not there. The, the work for them whenever they get done, uh, there's just, you know, there's only so many people that have, there's a lot of have not. So to be able to get paid and do work, horse work, it's pretty hard. Uh, and then there's no provision for continuing education. You know, as a veterinarian in Texas, we're required to get 17 hours of continuing education every year. That means we go to meetings to learn what's new, um, you know, review research and, and talk with uh, colleagues. Uh, and, and over, you know, I've been in practice for 16 years. I mean, that's, that's, you know, 250 hours of, of continuing education at minimum. And I typically attend several conferences a year, you know, to stay up. They get none. There's none required and there's none provided. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think it, with our volunteer group, you know, we're, we go down and we spend one day providing continuing education to these um, veterinarians and veterinary students and where we can just talk with them as a group and one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, lay our hands on horses together, um, share some of the stuff we know. And I think that that, uh, that can be awesome. I mean, that's kind of going back to teaching people to fish. And, and uh, you know, we're all about that. Uh, we've met some great friends. We've had people that have uh, been provided opportunities to come to Texas and come work uh, and to come learn, you know, more in depth through externships and internships and and, and, and those people would have never had that opportunity. And I would have never had that opportunity to share that with them if it weren't for Full Bucket. I think so Full Bucket just, it provides such a, 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 a conduit for us to reach people. And I, I, and I thought I was done, but I'll say one more thing. <laughs> no, keep uh, this is good. Well, I mean, I, I think, and you know, because you've been there and, and you and I share a lot of the same friends, but, you know, I think Full Bucket also provides something for our veterinarians in the in the U.S. as well. I think that innately all of us have the desire to give back, right? And, and just in our lives, we're constantly looking for where are those opportunities? Are they with our community? Are they with our church? Are they um, at a local soup kitchen? Are they um, uh, through the rotary? Are they, you know, where are they? But we're always looking. We're always looking. And we, we want that satisfaction uh, vacation that we can that what we're doing is meaningful and that what we do maybe we're using unique skills of our own that um, that, that 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 no one else has and we're using those skills that we bust our tails for lots of years to develop ourselves as veterinarians um, and we're using those uh, on people uh, in, in a way that that you as a non veterinarian wouldn't be able to do um, and, and that's where I think that Full Bucket and getting behind this type of work, um, you've seen the number of veterinarians that have all of a sudden, there's been a door open for them to go and plug in. And 
And I think that's, that's massive. Uh, to me, I take a lot of pride in that. I love to see people um, find their wings and they go down. And I've had veterinarians who are ultra successful, top of their game. And also some very well-traveled veterinarians, some veterinarians that take extravagant vacations. And I've had them tell me that there's nothing better. They have not spent a better week in their life. And these are people that go to Hawaii all the time that, you know, that go and work on the best horses in the world. And they go and they sweat in the, in the hills of Guatemala and they eat dodgy street food and sleep on uncomfortable beds. And, uh, and they say that that's the best week of their year. And they go back year after year because it, it, it feels so good to give back. And I think as a company for Full Bucket, it feels good to give back. Um, I, I hear that from the horse owners as well, that, that um, you know, that their participation with Full Bucket, um, just, through, just through the support of the products and things like that is, is, is another tie back to, you know, at least giving – Giving back in some manner. Right. To get. You're exactly so. right. And I think that, you know, people have a choice these days that, um, that businesses like ours are showing up every day in all parts of the marketplace. And, you know, I think people have a choice. They can, they can choose to support companies that have benevolence. Uh, and, and, and ours is, you know, we advertise a one for one, but, you know, I mean, there's really so many facets of what we do. Um, you know, I think the cool stuff we're going to do with the AAP this winter and with the, you know, the Santa jackets. And I mean, it's just, it, it, it goes, it goes beyond just the one for one. I think that is certainly our, our battle cry, but I, I think we can't help ourselves, but try to find new ways to, to give. And, um, and, and I think that, that consumers have that opportunity. They can choose to, to do business with people that, that share that spirit or they can choose to do business with people that don't. And I mean, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't shame anyone for not. Um, but I just think that it, it's certainly good to be that alternative uh, in the marketplace that, that gives those people a chance. Cause even as a consumer, you want your, you want your money to go good. I mean, who doesn't round up for, for some, for a good cause, you know I mean? On, on Amazon or, or something like that. It's, it's, it's the right thing to do, and I think we're all kind of feel like uh, feel better in our in our Western shopping experience when we do do something like that because we we all have a lot to give. Yeah, I agree, and and um, you know, Rob, I I think we we we're going to wrap it up, but I want to thank you so much for you know taking time out of your busy schedule and visiting today, and um, uh, you know, and if if anyone wants to learn more, they can go to fullbucket.org. That's uh, fullbucket.org. Um, to learn more about the uh, the products themselves and the philanthropy, um, there's some really cool videos and information on there, and uh, there's there's a lot of documentation and white papers that if you want to drive deeper into knowing more about probiotics or or supplements, um, you can learn there. And uh, thanks again, Rob, and and uh, we'll see you soon. My pleasure. Talk right. to you later. Take care.